of what we do all season long. Some people think that making data visualizations is like, oh, I have data, let's, let's put it in a dashboard. <laughs> well, these are much more like, it might look like a dashboard, but it's a living application of uh, things that you can share and take off the platform. Um, you can remix this. But it's running in the cloud, and that's important for us. When we think about, you know, I don't have an exact figure. I'm going to take a really random guess here, but it feels like the amount of public data that government's using, maybe one half of 1% of it is available in the cloud. Imagine if we can go from that to 5% next year. Something that could come along and accelerate this pace, it would change the entire data economy. Because when we look at the problems that we're solving, rather than just trying to create advertisements and capture eyeballs, all of this data science innovation that's driven through marketing, we have much more interesting problems to solve. And the technology that we're using is the same technology that these big companies use. You've heard of some of this. Our entire platform is built on AWS. And when you get all of this data in the cloud, the next thing that you want to do is you need to analyze it. And you need massive compute power to do that. And we have a partnership with Intel that allows the Civic Platform to be connected to Intel's AI and compute cluster machines. So this data that's too big for you to host on your servers, now you can analyze this and you can show it in real time. And you can begin to iterate from there. So, <laughs> again, live demo, what you're going to see is our best chance of building stories on this in six months, although the platform has been in development for a long time. We did a code freeze at 4 p.m. today, except, <laughs> except for Michael, our CTO, I saw him at 5.30 doing <laughs> um, We've also had amazing support to make this possible tonight. I am just enormously proud that we have the city of Portland as our partner adopting the Civic Platform. But, but not only that, we've got Multnomah County and Metro. Different data and different services we have the trifecta. Uh, other bureaus that we have special relationships with, um, PBOT, Bureau of um, uh, uh, Sustainability and uh, Planning, Smart Cities, PDX, Prosper Portland. We also have our volunteers um, that are working at some of these companies that are amazing here in Portland. They're supporting us too. Their people will be up on stage tonight presenting these projects. AWS Elemental, Instrument, Slalom, Fire, <laughs> New Relic, and Puppet. These are some of our best technology companies, most creative agencies, consultancies. We're all working side by side in the Hack Oregon project room. We also work with national sponsors that have deep domain experience like Transit Center. They came out from New York tonight. Where are you? PGE, disaster resilience, that's important. Of course, we're working with Intel and their compute technology and AI lab here in just over the corner in Hillsboro. And something that is also exciting, um, we're not going to get too much into like the code and the tech tonight that made these projects, but in about a month we will because we've got a three-hour workshop at OSCON where we will be releasing this to the open source community on the internet. This train cannot be stopped. So if you want to learn how to build on Civic, we'll have um, our top engineers there teaching you how to do it. And of course, uh, this is an event that's part of a global smart cities conference that's here in Portland. It's called Global Tech Jam. And I, this is sponsored by the TAO and something called the Global uh, Teams Challenge. Uh, this is a national project. And I'm very proud to introduce to the stage Saku Ri from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He'll say a few words about this project and Smart Cities Global. Thank you. Wow. I've been on many stages before, but it's the first time I'm staying inside of a real theater that I cannot see any of you guys, literally. 
So I feel like I'm here to perform the musical like cats. <laughs> that was a real joke. So you, you guys laughed and that's great. Um, so um, I lead a, uh, a global program. It's a uh, federal government program, but the scope is really global. As name implies, a global city teams challenge. Uh, there's a smart city challenge program uh, to identify and replicate best practices and advanced technologies in collaboration with corporations and nonprofits, uh, universities, and governments. And especially the role of the volunteers and non government entities like Heck Oregon is critical in making this successful. A smart city cannot be smart without smart citizens. Smart citizen doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're intellectual this smart. I mean, it's good to be intellectual smart, but that's not the uh, sufficient condition. You have to be engaged. You all have to engage into these activities. Sometimes you have to do your own coding. Sometimes you gotta share your knowledge. Sometimes you gotta work with others that may have a very different backgrounds as yours and get things working to improve the quality of life of a city. So, uh, along that line, I'm very happy to be here. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you to Hack Oregon, and which you've turned into a Civic Software Foundation. I just saw it. Congratulations. Um, and then I'm here to introduce, actually, the, the a team here, uh, which is a Disaster Resilience Team. So please welcome Disaster Resilience Team. So earlier this year, our team attended an event uh, related to earthquakes. And there was a professor on the panel, and he said the best thing that Portland can do to prepare for a 9.0 Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is to have a 5.8 earthquake. <laughs> All right, I thought I might get a couple of giggles. <laughs> Um, so our team was really shook by this, uh, as well as the rest of the audience. Um, but though it is a little bit dark, the, the point is that Portland's not prepared for an earthquake because we haven't experienced one before. So this really resonated with our team because a lot of the research that we've done has shown that communities that have previously experienced large earthquakes are more prepared for the more recent earthquakes that have impacted them. Um, an example would be uh, Chile. They had a 9.5 earthquake in 1960. Japan has 7.0 earthquakes almost annually. Um, while these earthquakes are extremely terrible, um, they do destroy buildings and infrastructure. It does allow the city to rebuild the infrastructure to higher standards. And hopefully in the future, um, less, there will be less injuries uh, because these standards will have been, uh, the infrastructure will have been built to better standards. So um, the other thing that we learned is that social capital is also really important in resilience. So the mayor of Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, after their recent earthquakes, uh, which is a 7.2 in 2010 and a 6.1 in 2011. Um, she talked about social capital and that being important. And Scott, wherever Scott is, uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about that later. So, uh, in lieu of a 5.8 earthquake in Portland, um, our team has collectively uh, worked for the last 23 weeks on a project uh, that we hope can drive Portland to be more prepared. So hi, my name is Christina. Um, I'm the executive producer for the Disaster Resilience Team. Uh, this lovely group behind me, as well as one more team member who is unable to attend today, have been working, like I said, for the last 23 weeks on this project. And I just wanted to call out um, that on our team, uh, we have four active neighborhood emergency team members. Uh, so these are individuals that have been trained by the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management 
as well as uh, Portland Fire and Rescue to, <laughs> to respond to emergency disasters in their neighborhood. So this is an especially important project for these team members. So, as I said, um, our team name is Disaster Resilience. I don't know how many of you uh, opened your phone to see, like, look up resilience. What is it? Um, so we have a definition that's driven us. Um, so this comes from Judith Rodin uh, the, in the Great Resilience Dividend. I won't read the whole thing, um, but it is, it is great. Um, resilience is the capacity of any entity, an individual, a community, an organization, or a natural system to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. So our project, using open data to make a city more resilient, is a very heavy one. So we had to focus somehow. So we focus on the most likely and largest uh, disaster scenario, so the 9.0 Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And there's a lot that we want to tell you about it. There's a lot of data. There's a lot that we want to show. We had to narrow it down. So we used four goals to do this. The first thing, we want to educate on the potential impacts of this earthquake at the address level, at the neighborhood level, and at the city level. We want to simplify uh, the next steps for an individual to become more prepared for an earthquake. We want to call out the importance of social capital and making a community more resilient. And we want to make a recommendation as to where to start. So, uh, Aaron, <laughs> Aaron is going to uh, walk you through how we went from these goals to our vision uh, and to our final product. Um, and this is something that uh, we hope is helpful for the individual, um, for the city planner, um, as well as for government officials. So, with that, Aaron. All right, so um, when we think about a 9.0 Cascadia quake, um, like Christina said, Portland does not have a history of earthquakes, so people's first question tends to be, um, how bad is it really gonna be? Um, and how bad is the shaking gonna be? And then people tend to think, well, is my house gonna be standing? And am I gonna be able to use the bridge to get home? And then you start thinking, um, how do we even prepare for something of this magnitude? So um, to navigate those kinds of questions, um, our team comes from a wide variety of backgrounds, which was a real asset, because we're gonna use a lot of really disparate data sets um, from our data partners, including um, Dogami, the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> um, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management and um, PG&E. And, PG &E. and um, we're using these data sets to build a story that is gonna help uh, an individual to navigate all of these questions that we have about earthquakes. Um, so we'll start with some of the physical data. Um, so this map is showing us modified Mercalli index across the city of Portland. Um, modified Mercalli tells you what the shaking is like at a given point. So this is a little different than when you think of the Richter scale in 9.0. And what you can see across the city of Portland is that we have two colors that would be um, very strong and severe. Um, <laughs> but the good news is the scale goes to 10 and we only have seven and eight. So that might help you sleep better at night. Um, and as you, uh, we rolled up this data into neighborhoods because um, Portlanders identify very strongly with their neighborhoods. So you can see this data on the neighborhood level and when you roll over these neighborhoods, it'll tell you a little bit more information about what to expect from the shaking in that specific area. Um, and then we also have a map that shows um, liquefaction, which is the process by which the ground actually becomes a liquid, um, and landslides. So uh, this is our deformity intensity. And you can see on both of these maps um, the, the bulk of the damage or the bulk of the shaking and intensity and deformation is gonna be along the rivers, um, which is downtown um, and also on the Columbia. Um, yeah, so <laughs> our idea, what our users are going to be able to do is to drill down into this data in a lot of different ways. So you're going to be able to um, use these maps 
to look at your address within a two or three block radius. You're gonna be able to look at your neighborhood and see um, data like fatalities expected in your neighborhood and um, the number of displaced people in your neighborhood, the cost of rebuilding your neighborhood. So we have all this information. Our hope is that people will spend a lot of time thinking about it, looking at um, the implications also at the city level for infrastructure. Um, so knowing what you know now, how many people feel prepared for a major earthquake? Or how many people feel like now is the time to panic? <laughs> Don't panic. We've got you. Um, so how do you take this information and then use it um, to actually prepare effectively? Um, so can you flip to the quiz? So we built a quiz which is gonna ask you a bunch of questions about how prepared you are. So what have you done to prepare? And this isn't to judge you. You're gonna go through and answer some questions. <laughs> and then it's gonna tell you exactly what your next steps should be. So if you haven't done anything to prepare, and you're a complete novice at this, it's gonna tell you where to start. And if you've done some things, but maybe you're not fully ready, it's gonna tell you what your next three priorities should be. And the explanations are concise, they're clear, and they're actionable. And our goal in this is to really empower people to start preparing and um, to really avoid the paralyzing information overload that's out there when you start to think about preparing. Um, so our goal with this is that people will see exactly what to expect from the earthquake and then they will be able to use this quiz to move forward. Um, but personal preparedness is only one component of resiliency. So to talk about a more complete picture, um, of disaster preparedness and community resiliency is Scott, who's gonna talk about our neighborhoods and social capital. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Scott and I have the honor of being your guide as we kind of close this up on the last presenter. And we're gonna take a quick, but just a little bit of a deeper dive into our data. But first, I get to give you a quiz. So Christina alluded to it in the very beginning, but in 2010 and 2011, uh, the city of Christchurch, New Zealand experienced uh, dual earthquakes that, although not as severe as the earthquake that's supposed to hit our area, still had widespread and profound effects. Um, in the aftermath, the city experienced some depopulation, and Christchurch actually fell from the second largest, most populous city in New Zealand to the third largest. And they're actually still recovering uh, to some degree from the disaster today. Fast forward to 2017, the mayor of Christchurch visited Portland um, to talk about lessons learned. And when asked for the single most important piece of advice she could offer to Portland residents, do you know what she said? Was it retrofit your houses, uh, give disaster kits to everyone, or uh, reinforce your bridges? The answer is no. Someone called it out just a minute. It was just a second ago, it was meet your neighbors. Huh. Meet your neighbors. During that Christchurch earthquake, 90% of rescues in that initial golden hour after the earthquake hit were by neighbors. Mm. Furthermore, uh, personal connections and interactions with your neighbors uh, are just one important element of what scientists have dubbed social capital. Think of it as a mixture of regional trust, connectedness, and sense of civic responsibility. It's kind of hard to define, but you know it if you've lived in an area with high social capital. People tend to know each other, trust each other, and make investments of time and resources to maintain and improve their communities. So the, research we bring this, the reason why we bring this up is that recent research has demonstrated that regions with higher social capital tend to be more resilient. Studies of communities in that dual, Christina talked about it, the uh, dual Tohoku subduction zone earthquake and subsequent nuclear meltdown suggests that regions with higher social capital had fewer fatalities and recovered faster, and these effects were even more important than the physical infrastructure itself. So now we know it's important, but how do you measure something abstract and kind of squishy like social capital? How could our team, given our time constraints and lack of expertise, uh, compare neighborhoods in a quantifiable way? So we couldn't really do a door-to-door -door survey but we turned to some novel research that found that there really is something readily available, updated, and rigorously maintained, and that is the census, census response rates. 
Scholars have been able to establish that measures of social capital, like civic engagement, community participation, some of the things that I just talked about, they are highly correlated with the region's census response rate. And it may sound odd, but if you think about it for a minute, it stands to reason. There's really no individual benefit to someone filling out the census. You have to remember it, it takes effort. Um, and really the only motivation is a sense of civic duty or obligation. The theory is that that region's census return rate can tell us something deeper about its social fabric and community mm. orientation. And those same traits that might drive someone to respond to the census might predict how likely they are to help a neighbor in need, check on a, a vulnerable neighbor, or participate in a vigorous way, vigorous way in a recovery. So now that we found something that might give us an indication of the region's social capital, we analyzed it. Can you pull up the map, please? And here's what that looks like. On this map, the intensity of the uh, color responds to its response rate. And you can see variation across our city, as you might expect. On the high side, we see neighborhoods like Collins View, Southwest Hills, Alameda, probably not surprising. On the lower side, we have Glen Fair, Powerhurst, Gilbert, and Park Rose. Now it's important, even as I mentioned this, to remind ourselves it's an, this isn't a perfect measure and that we're just looking at one single indicator of something very difficult to define. And the point of our analysis wasn't to single out any neighborhoods, but we were really interested to take this measure of each neighborhood's social capital and compare it to the earthquake impact. By doing this, we can see where the intersection of lower relative social capital meets with higher relative earthquake impact. And these so-called hotspots might then be areas of higher priority for uh, resource allocation and community building. And so here's, we built that, and here's what that looks like. So this is a scatter plot of census non-response rate versus the ratio of uh, displaced residents. We picked that metric to show uh, in terms of impact. Um, and again, this is in the wet scenario, uh, 9.0 subduction earthquake, which is, the, which is the worst case. The displaced ratio was calculated from this new data from Dagami that we received, and they used well-established models to estimate the number of displaced people in each uh, census block group. Each dot is a neighborhood with the size of each, na with the size of each dot proportional to its population size. We colored the dots by city quadrant, such as northeast, southeast, etc., to give you some idea of the spatial distribution. And so on the vertical axis here, you have per capita displacement, and then census response rate is on the horizontal. And really what you, to boil it down, as you go further to the top right, that's where worse overlaps worse. So I think there's some really interesting things to see here. You can see a cluster